you can see him. I <laughs> hope it doesn't affect him up there. All right, God bless you in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Today's June 21st, Father's Day, 2020. I'm Donnie Lamb, and I'm here with all of you today in Otis Orchards, Washington. And for all of you that are listening in, we're certainly blessed to have you with us here today also. And if you would, please take your Bibles, and let's turn to the Gospel of John, John chapter 4 to begin with. I would like to look at something with all of you this morning that, for many people in the world today, is a very difficult subject. And I've been thinking about this for the past couple of weeks, and, and I thought, you know, for many people, this is a barrier to the acceptance of God. And it's accompanied with refusal to admit that he even exists. And the it that I'm talking about, of course, would be spirit. And so I'd like to consider spirit a little bit this morning. And one of the reasons this is so difficult for so many people is due to the fact that spirit cannot be seen. It can't be heard, smelled, touched, or taste, tasted by the five senses. Therefore, any true scientist would be hard-pressed to say that, yeah, it does not exist. They would say that it's non-quantifiable because it cannot be measured. Hence, there are a multitude of people and individuals today that reject God and even the concept of God because they can't see Him. They can't hear Him. They can't smell Him. They can't touch Him. God is spirit, and spirit is something that is beyond the five senses and is not registered by them. And in John chapter 4, verse 24, we see in the first part of the verse there that it says, God is a spirit. And the rest of that verse is great too. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And that certainly bears heavy impact and consideration for people. But God's not just a spirit among many. He is the Holy Spirit. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that is therein. If you would please turn to Hebrews chapter 11. God's not just a spirit as one among many. He is the Holy Spirit. And for, for many people that live by their senses alone, I, I can understand the difficulty with this because as we can see here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now believing, I'm, this is from the working translation, but if you would please just read along in your King James or whatever it is version that you're reading from. Now believing is the foundation or the title deed of matters hoped for, the proof of things, what? Not seen. So there's something that's required on the part of individuals that want to broaden their understanding and their scope of what life consists of. Verse 2 says, in fact, by it, by believing, the elders received witness, a good report from God. By believing, we understand that the ages have been fully prepared by the word of God for that which is seen has not come into existence from things that are visible. So yeah, <coughs> if you are a scientist, it's non-quantifiable. <laughs> you can't measure it. You can't see it. it. So that's why so many people, and especially students in college and even in high school and, and other places now, it's being pushed so hard that science is the, it's the new religion. You know, it's we you got to go with science no matter what. Well, I'm so thankful for the teaching that I've received, as, uh, along with most of us, if not all of us here today, that God can be known by his word, that we can know God, even though we can't see him, hear him, smell him, taste him, or touch him, but he can be known by his word. And even though God being spirit is not detectable by these five senses, 
his words, both written and spoken in the senses realm, can be. And I'm reminded of the verse in John 6, 63, where Jesus said, as he addressed the individuals gathered at a synagogue one day, he said, it's the spirit that quickeneth or makes alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. If you would turn to Isaiah chapter 45. That day Jesus Christ, as he was addressing those people in the synagogue, he told them that it's the spirit that makes alive. And we're going to look at that here just a little bit in a minute. It's the spirit that makes alive. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, the words that he was speaking were words of spirit. And life. In Isaiah chapter 45, I just, this is such a great passage here. We're going to begin in verse 18. Isaiah 45, 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it, not in vain. He, per he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. <clears throat> I've not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain, or ye seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. Mm -hmm. Tell ye, and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient times? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. What a passage, huh? This passage from Isaiah 45, we can see that God has, from antiquity, he's reached out to mankind to help mankind, to understand the nature of life, to know him, the one true God, and to ultimately be saved. And one of the downfalls of mankind is they don't understand the need for a Savior, as it's so wonderfully explained in the, in the early parts of the book of Genesis. Reverend Cummins did a just a fantastic chapter. It's the first chapter in one of, the, one of his books. It's the blue one. I can't remember what it's called. Now, it escapes my memory. But it's that first chapter, and it just, it just totally opens that whole subject up. The need for a Savior. You know, why should I go? I want to be saved. Well, you know, it's, it's a little bit broader than what most people have considered. <laughs> Due to the cataclysmic fall of man in the, in the book of Genesis, as it's recorded, and the accompanying loss of spirit life, which he originally was created with, mankind has cons consequently been separated and alienated from the life of the benevolent and loving creator. And losing their spiritual life in connection which man originally had with his creator has sentenced mankind to living not only by what, just only by what he can see, hear, smell, taste, or touch. And this was truly the case and situation for all of mankind until our Lord Jesus Christ, who by the direction of his Father fulfilled everything required in order to bring about the new birth. And this new birth is a birth from above. And it's once again, it's a creation of spirit within those individuals who confess Jesus as Lord and believe God raised him from the dead. And this once again enables an individual who was up to that point only two parts, body and soul or breath life, to once again be a three-part being of body, soul, and spirit. There, there's really none like our God it's 
he's just so amazing. He's so loving. All the things that he has done to correct man's shortcomings and the sabotage of the devil to everything that he had already had in working order is just amazing. Um, you know, the Bible is written for those who really want to know and understand the truth. It, it's one of the things that can be learned from the Bible is that there is an entire another realm comprised of spirit, which is not visible or detectable by the five senses. If you would turn to Second Kings chapter six, I just love this little this little section we're going to look at here in Second Kings chapter six, because it so wonderfully shows that there's so much more going on than most people consider throughout the day, every day, any day. Second Kings chapter 6. We'll begin in verse 13. And he, this would be speaking of the king of Syria, said, Go and spy where he, the man of God, Elisha, is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he's in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and com encompassed, or they surrounded this, the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he said, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with him. Just how simple was that, huh? And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Just a little bit more than what you would normally get to glimpse with the five senses there, right? But, once again, it just, it, it, as, a, as an explanation of this whole concept, there's so much more going around us on a daily basis than people have any idea about. There's a whole other spiritual realm out there. Many years ago, Dr. Werewell, who was, for many of us, a teacher and a mentor, <laughs> some of the, the most fun learning, I don't know if that's not a proper way of saying things, fun learning, you know, but some of the greatest learning I think we received were at night out, or when he'd just be sitting around thinking about stuff and want to share it with somebody. And one of those days, <clears throat> he just sat down and started talking with us about spirit. And he talked about there being in existence different kingdoms, he called them, or maybe realms would be a better word today. And he said each one was superior to the next. And quite honestly, I've never seen anything in God's word which contradicts what he explained. And honestly, there's an abundance of scripture that, that demonstrates it is correct. And he explained that first of all, there's the kingdom of God which is a spiritual realm, and it's over all. And in it, there is the Creator and God who is over all, our Heavenly Father, who is spirit. And within this spiritual realm, there are also other spirit beings that He created, and these are referred to as angels. There are, in addition to the angels, other spirit beings that ages ago rebelled against God and were expelled from heaven. These spirit beings are led by Satan, and even though they were expelled from heaven, they're still nonetheless spirit beings. And this realm of the spirit is not visible to the eyes or detectable, detectable by any of the five senses, as we just saw from that account, unless God opens someone's eyes up so they can see it. There's another realm below the spiritual realm, which is the physical realm, and this is the realm and world in which we live, surrounded by the sun and the moon and the stars of heaven. And this physical realm functions on physical laws, which can be measured and analyzed. Laws such as gravity and other laws of physics. However, these laws in this realm are not greater than the spiritual realm. 
And the world of the physical can be overruled by the world of the spiritual. The life and earthly ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ consistently demonstrated this with signs, miracles, and wonders which he performed. So obviously, he was he was operating on a higher level than what most people were have available to him. Another realm is what many refer to as the plant kingdom. And below this would be another that's referred to by some as a mineral realm or a mineral kingdom. Each one of these realms that we just lifted here is superior to the next, and as such, each subsequent realm is generally not aware of the one superior to it. Minerals, for instance. Minerals are not aware of the plants which live from the richness they supply. Plants are not aware of animals and people which live from the abundance they supply. Finally, and sadly, many people are not aware that there is a spiritual realm far superior to the physical one in which they exist. So here's what's so fascinating about all these different realms. And this is what Dr. Earl taught us that day. All of life, no matter what level or realm we just discussed, all of life is spirit. And with this being said, i got to explain, all of life is spirit, but not all spirit is eternal life spirit. Okay? There are different kinds of spirit. Let's turn, uh, well, let's see. Where do we want to go? There, well, perhaps, let me talk about this mineral realm for a second, too. Um, I ended this explanation here with um, the mineral realm just a moment ago, but perhaps this could this should be called something more as it appears just from observation that the earth itself is even alive. This life would also by necessity, it would be different from all the other types and levels of life that we're considering also. But as is true of the other realms, I, I don't think this life could be observed either. Consider, if you will, the difference between the Earth and the Moon, or Mars, for instance. Mars, you know, they've got a camera running around on Mars for a decade now, taking pictures and looking at stuff. And Mars bears all the geological evidence to indicate that it was once alive, or it at least sustained life at some, some level. The Moon, however, doesn't. It's just lifeless. It, it's a target for, <laughs> for asteroids and things flying through <laughs> space. It's sort of like a mobile home in a tornado. <laughs> that's, that's for all you folks in the South. Okay? I was once there. The continents of Earth indicate from their shapes that at one point in time they all fit together as a single large landmass. So there's evidence that shows the continents of land move independently one from another upon the Earth. However, they move very slowly. This movement's measured by satellites today, and although it's only inches per year, its movement nonetheless, and over millennia, it produces a very dynamic change. Layer upon layer of geological evidence indicates that the Earth replenishes itself from the inside out. Mountains continue to push upward, volcanoes continue to erupt, islands continue to form, and continents subside beneath one another. All of this movement, all of this, many say is due to the core of our planet being liquid, or more precisely, it's molten nickel and iron. But whatever it is that keeps this process going, it's the life of our planet. <coughs> and it's not visible to the naked eye, or to anything that science has been able to detect or analyze. We talked about different levels of life. So that would be like the earth or the mineral level. Uh, you know, above that, the life which plants have is supported by what we call photosynthesis. It's a different type of life than obviously what we were just discussing that the earth itself has. The photosynthesis is not the life itself, but it's, it's the process necessary in order to support the life. In this process of photosynthesis, light, 
Carbon dioxide and water are absorbed by a plant or a tree or any kind of vegetation, even algae in the sea. And the byproduct of that is it produces oxygen. <laughs> and in this process, which fuels the life of the vegetation, you cannot see the life itself. Can you see the life that a shrub outside has? No, you can't see the life. You can see the result of the life. You can't see it. And that's because all of life, even plant life, is spirit. And spirit cannot be seen. We all know the next level up on this is called soul life or breath life, which is very near and dear to all of us. It's what we all have, right? Leviticus 17.11 says that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And this is very interesting. If you remove the blood, the body is no longer alive, correct? That's right. But interestingly, if you examine the blood, even under a microscope, the life cannot be observed within the blood. You can take blood from an alive person and transfuse it intravenously into a dead person, and it won't make the dead person alive again. Isn't that interesting? And there's, there are three primary things that sustain this soul life or breath life for the individuals that have it. Oxygen, water, and food. I didn't mean for this to be a science lesson. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's very fascinating to think about. Even though we have soul life, the soul life needs to be sustained. That's okay. It's the oxygen contained within the blood which moves the nutrients throughout the body. But one cannot look at the oxygen or the process in the lungs or in the other organs and see the life, the soul life that keeps the body alive. Once again, all of life, even soul life, is spirit. And spirit cannot be seen. So, as we were considering at the opening of this, that there are so many people today who refuse to believe God or believe that God even exists because they can't see him, I wonder how many of them would think or question their own existence because they can't see so long. <laughs> right? You know, if somebody, and, and I think this is a good logical argument for people that, that present this. Well, you show me God and I'll believe him. I'll say, okay, you show me your life and I'll believe you too because you can't see soul life either. So, if you would turn to Romans, um, or actually turn to Acts chapter 1. All of life is spirit, but not all spirit is eternal life spirit. I thought, man, what a statement. But for us, it's the new birth that gives us life in the spiritual realm, and it makes us what God's word says, a new creation. Life is so extremely fragile until one gets to the new birth. <coughs> one of the <laughs> and then when you get to the new birth, it's indestructible. <laughs> it never stops. It never ends. All of life, until you get to eternal <coughs> life spirit, is just fragile. Manifesting Holy Spirit, the new birth, in thinking about this whole thing about spirit, manifesting Holy Spirit has to be the height of human experience, expression, and accomplishment because it's manifesting life on a greater level than is normally expressed, experienced, or manifested by soul life. It's, it's, it's got to be the greatest thing we ever do. It's the greatest thing about us. And we can't even see it. But we know it's there because we understand spiritual laws, which are greater than physical laws, that overrule the, the physical by believing. Yeah, this is, this is, it's something. And this is what our Heavenly Father, along with our Lord Jesus Christ, have so diligently been concerned about making possible to mankind to have once again. It was the promise of the Father. In Acts chapter 1, Verse 4, it says, And being assembled together with them, 
Jesus, speaking of Jesus, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you've heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with Holy Spirit, not many days hence. If you turn to chapter 2. This one I know everybody. We've read this so many times, but it's still just so incredible when you consider what it is happening for the first time. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly they, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. How did people know they were filled? They could manifest that Spirit. Could they see that Spirit? Not any more than you can see your breath life. But what does that breath life manifest? This, moving around and speaking and talking. And what did the Holy Spirit manifest? The Spirit life of God Himself that He created within each and every one of us every time somebody confesses Jesus as Lord and believes God raised him from the dead. Isn't that amazing? Romans chapter 8. Well, Acts, let's look at this other one. Acts chapter 2 verse 33. Peter continuing on that day of Pentecost, he said, <coughs> Therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of Holy Spirit, he hath shed forth this which you now see and hear. It was the fulfillment of the promise of the Father that had been in work ever since Genesis chapter 3. Thousands, thousands of years. And now, if you would, Romans chapter 8. And I, I'd like to look at just a few verses here that show a few different aspects of this Spirit that we get and that we can manifest and that we have proof of in the senses world by that manifestation which the world one of these days maybe will get they'll catch up I don't know Romans 8 chapter chapter 8 verse 15 it says for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but you've received the spirit of adoption or sonship is what it should read we have received the spirit of sonship whereby we cry Abba or Father, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How do we know? Because we can speak in tongues. We can manifest it. And if children then we're heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon, or that's the word I it means to logically impute that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Uh, down to verse 26. Here's another great aspect of this, this spirit that we can manifest. In verse 26 it says, Likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmity. It should be singular. For this is our infirmity. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. We don't. We don't know what to pray for. I mean, we, we prayed for an individual this morning this, you know, that having some health issues. I, I don't know specifically what to pray for, but we can speak in tongues, right? Mm -hmm. And when we speak in tongues, the Spirit helps our infirmity or our inability of not knowing what we, we should pray for as we ought. And it does this as it makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because it makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. What an what a incredible verse. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. We know that all th that verse, that Romans eight twenty eight. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Look at the context where it's placed there with manifesting Spirit and praying. In chapter two of Ephesians, 
verse 18, it says, For through him, speaking of Jesus Christ, we both, that would be Judeans and Gentiles, we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints in the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. Perhaps this is the greatest single aspect here in verse 22 of this new spirit nature we all have or can have if you get born again. Verse 22, in whom you also are built together for a habitation of God through the spirit. God dwells within us. Chapter 6. <laughs> Chapter 6. At the, the culmination of all this great revelation that is in the book of Ephesians. The first three being doctrinal and the second three chapters being how to, how to walk that walk. The practical. It says in verse 10 of chapter 6, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of whose might? Yes. In the power of his might. Why? Because it's on a whole nother level above what your body and your mind can do with your five senses. It can tell you of things you would have no knowledge of any other way. It can tell you what's going on in a situation you would not have any knowledge of any other way. And it's so much stronger than the strength that we have. All you have to do is look at the life and ministry of Jesus Christ and go, wow. That's what we got. That's what we got. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So without spirit, how, without Holy Spirit, how are we going to be sufficient in any contest? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of believing wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Remember? Jesus Christ said, the words that I speak unto you are spirit and they are life. It's the sword of the spirit. Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication. How? In the spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. What a high and mighty calling we have had, guys. It's just amazing. And we'll, let's look here at... Uh, Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is where we'll close. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 is an exhortation for our godly behavior. It says, Now we exhort you, brethren, Warn them that are unruly, comfort the weak-minded, support the weak, and be patient toward all men. Yeah, I have to slap myself in the mirror every morning sometimes just thinking about some of these verses. Re <laughs> See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but follow after, or follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. What's this next verse say? Pray, Pray without ceasing. You know, I asked myself this week if that's a figure of speech. <laughs> I mean, really, I did. I don't know if it's possible. I know it, it's, it's, it's not, at this point for me, at my growth in my life, it hasn't been possible for me up to this point to pray without ceasing. I sure give it a good endeavor. But you know what? If you're having to focus on something like, 
driving 35 kids in a vehicle <laughs> that are screaming and yelling in the back. And one's picking on another one and another one's trying to crawl under the seat to the other side and <laughs> someone else is throwing something at someone else. <laughs> oh, and there happens to be traffic outside the bus too. It's kind of hard to focus on everything at once. Pray without ceasing. So, thank God for speaking in tongues, huh? Man, without that, quench not the spirit. Well, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Just in case you ever wonder what it is that the will of God in Christ Jesus is for you in your life, well, there it is. In everything give thanks. Be thankful. And in verse 19, quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain, abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that called you who also will do it. So what does God get, get out of all this? It says in Deuteronomy chapter 32 that the Lord's portion is his people. You know, at the, at the conclusion of the accomplished work of Jesus Christ a couple thousand years ago, at the end of the gospel, God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And it turned the world upside down when he did. The devil would have never crucified Jesus Christ if he had known the mystery that God kept secret. And at that point, God had several options available to him. One was he could have gone straight into what everybody thought was going to happen and what people like John the Baptist had been looking for even during the ministry of Jesus Christ. And that would have been the day of the Lord, which was prophesied about and which is still future to come. He could have gone straight into that period, right then. And, of course, the wrath of God accompanies all this. And we can read from the book of Revelation some other things that, I mean, honestly sound like science fiction sometimes. You know, I mean, it's like, what? What? <laughs> there's, there's, that's going to open up and those things are going to come out <laughs> you know it's like wow but he didn't do that instead he instituted an entire administration a period of undisclosed time that we have learned is called the grace administration instead of the day of the Lord and the wrath of God God threw everyone even the angels in heaven a curve once again. <laughs> they had no idea this was coming. None. And he thought, I want an administration of grace. And, and, and so, okay, why would he want that is a good question. What is it that God is getting or gaining from this time period? He's gaining a family of people that love him. And that will spend all eternity with him. That's what he's getting. He's gaining a family of people that love him and will spend all eternity with him. And we don't know how long this period of time is going to last. If you're like me, you're in a hurry for it to be over. Then. <laughs> but if you look at it from God's perspective, look what he continues to gain every day. We help someone understand the greatness of who God really is, the greatness of spirit that is available, and the life that's available to, peer, to people that understand how to utilize and operate this spirit. And it has nine different man ways it can be manifest, which is just fascinating when you stop and consider the power and the ability that it gives every person that has Holy Spirit. You just look at the life of Jesus Christ and go, Wow. Yet it says, the things that I do, you shall do also in greater works than these. Just amazing. Well, we don't know how long this period is going to last, but we do know what comes next. 
And from reading the scriptures, it's frightening to those individuals that are going to have to endure it. It really is. But how fortunate we are to know what we know and have what we have in the assurances that we have from his word and having received the spirit nature that God originally intended man to have once again so that we can have fellowship with God. And not just that, but that we can have power in our lives to be victorious. We can walk in God's power. We can, we can be people that God has been waiting millennia, thousands of years to have as a family. And that's the, the beauty and the wisdom of God. And that, you know, could have went straight in to that period of time that's still down the road ahead. But he had this section of time. How fortunate we are to live in this day and time. And as I was thinking about a lot of these things, I thought, you know, life is all about spirit. That's it. Life is all about spirit. God is spirit. And all of life comes from God, no matter what level you're talking about. And you can't see the spirit. But all life is spirit. It's just not all life. is just all spirit is not an eternal life. Just, it just So I've been thinking about this for a couple weeks, and I thought, you know, maybe you get blessed if we looked at that and considered it too. Because when you leave here today, you walk out of here, and you've got a spirit nature within you that enables you to be victorious in any situation you encounter. It puts you in constant communication and contact, if you so desire, with your Heavenly Father. It gives you nine different ways of manifesting it. And he says he works all things to good to them that love him and are called to his, his purpose. So we got that going for us, which is nice also. Right? Mm -hmm. So anyhow, spirit's a big deal. And let's do our best to pray without ceasing. Huh? And pray for the saints, all right? So Father, thank you so much for your love and goodness to us. Thank you for this time in your word. I pray for all these wonderful people here and for everyone else that will hear or see this. And and ask that you would work in their hearts mightily to understand you and the nature that they have within them and how to operate it properly. And I thank you for these things and, and how you love us for this day and time we live in and for this week ahead, Father, for being with us. And I thank you for these things in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 God bless. Have a great week. Manifest Spirit. Manifest Spirit.